welcome back to another episode of the ICIS Energy Foresight Podcast. Today we talk everything AI, and I guess it's the most hyped topic right now. We are about to publish a white paper on data centers and their energy consumptions and what we see uh, coming. And I think it's super valuable uh, to frame the topic from a technological perspective. And I've got the right person for this with me. Christian Mastrodonato, Senior Director of Software Engineering at ICIS. Hi Chris and thanks for joining me. Hi Matteo, thanks a lot for having me, it's a pleasure. I think, you know, it's a very broad topic and probably the the initial starting point is is to go at the very basic of of the topic and just ask you a very simple question, Chris. What's AI and what are the current applications that are being explored? Well, actually, this is not at all a very simple question and it can actually be very broad. And it is first some t- to say sometimes that um, AI has become also a little bit of a buzzword and is used a bit of as a catch-all term for a lot of things that are happening in the industry. Uh, and, and if we look from that perspective, AI is actually a fairly old terminology and something that we have been using um, uh, all over the years. Historically, there are kind of two kind of AI or two kind of sort of directions you can take when you approach artificial intelligence. Uh, uh, one which is more uh, sort of based on logic and the way we structure our knowledge around knowledge management. Back in the day, they were called expert systems, which is really trying to map rigorously the way we reason and the connection between concepts, uh, which has a lot of applications, for example, in, um, in search engines. Uh, if when you use Google as an example and you search, uh, make a search in Google, you see besides the answers, actually is usually on the right side, you get a lot of structured information around uh, other concepts that can be related to whatever you're looking for. Um, and that's actually an element of using this structured knowledge uh, to sort of guide and, and reason and, and support in the query. The other side of the of AI is purely statistical and is really around uh, basically taking the fact that our brain is a statistical machine that makes prediction, that, that's what it does. Um, and so that's what is back in the days, I would say mainly during the 80s, the logical part, the structure part was the one that was most used, the 80s and 90s. And then over the last, uh, I would say, 20 years, uh, uh, it became more and more towards the neural networks and statistical approaches. Uh, interestingly enough, and that's also something that here in ICIS we're exploring, um, we are possibly getting to a place with generative AI where these two, uh, these two directions can, uh, can come together. It's also important to note that ICIS has been at the forefront of many of these developments of AI. Okay, so historically, I mean, the structural knowledge of our editors has been sort of exploited and it, it's there uh, to be used by our, uh, by our customers. And, and we have been working on neural network, in general statistical applications for, and forecasts for, for quite some years now. And we have been offering to our customers. And last but not least, we also recently, when this year launched Ask ICIS, uh, which is a generative AI application, also applied to a very, very specific uh, sector like ours, where the quality of information is very important in that sense. We, we think we can go. We 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 go beyond the sort of a very generalist approach that the uh, different gen AI application are offering, like uh, Anthropic and OpenAI and so forth, providing something very tailored to for the use of our customers. And I think that's something uh, quite interesting uh, from a perspective of thinking about AI use cases. That is super interesting, Chris. Uh, thanks for that. If I try to sum it up to bring it to the extreme. What you've just said to me is we started from something that was simple and smart manageable, we try to, but then over time, more and more computation is needed, right? And right now we are probably uh, on the brink of being at the extreme of the uh, computational need with the, with the generative AI. But more computation, obviously, to, in my mind, means different infrastructure that um, needs to support that. C- can you help us understand 
the, the whole journey would, of, of the past years, where, where, we, where we are right now and where we are going in, from an infrastructure point of view. Yes, yes, of course, happy to. Now, um, the journey has been kind of very interesting and, and I think the most important lens uh, is usually is to use, the, is just to move, to use Moore's Law. So Moore's Law it is, uh, Moore is actually one of the founder, founder of uh, Intel, the, I think everybody knows the, the chip company. Uh, he devised this, he realized that basically they could manage to double the number of transistors in a chip uh, every 18 months. And more or less this law stayed is still true, uh, and and at least in, in an extended fashion. Sometimes you don't necessarily have a double number of transistors, but in general, you, I would say if you talk about computational capacity, uh, that's what we manage to do. Uh, and that's interesting, especially because it means that you can generate way more computation uh, with decrease or or or, 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 or or better. The same amount of computation is also means it exponentially decreases the cost, which is also the other side of, of looking at this problem. Uh, now, uh, unless we look into laptops or, or, or home computers, which where actually power does have an element of importance, from a point of view of, let's say, business enterprise computation, power has never really been a problem. So historically, companies had their own data center, could be a room or a building. Uh, but then 20 years ago, roughly, Amazon came up with Amazon Web Services and, do, and, and basically they came up with the cloud computing concept. What does it mean? It means that you have these big companies, these big players, they have these huge data centers. And what you do is just rent virtually a space into that data center. And you don't need to go there uh, unless you really want to. You can just go, you can just connect remotely from your home and, and set up a virtual machine and, and load uh, all your applications running on top of that virtual machine. Uh, and that was a radical change because it meant, uh, uh, from a point of view of computation, anybody, any company could start sort of spinning up and scale up computation at incredible speed. And that would kind of create a huge uh, opportunity from the point of view of, uh, of especially startups to be able to create infrastructure very quickly and scale infrastructure very quickly. And, that's, and that was a, that was a big game changer. But it's very, very important to know that from this perspective, still energy consumption is, is a, a, a small number in the overall bill of material of a data center. Uh, and usually, by the way, most of that energy consumption is not computation, is cooling. Uh, is actually keep those machines at a certain temperature because, of course, if you go off the temperature uh, limits, you have basically the, the machine stop performing, you start in, introducing too many errors and, well, eventually they don't work anymore. Uh, so the, most of the energy consumption is in cooling. But at the moment, we don't, it doesn't really matter, I would assume, from an energy perspective, you need a certain amount of energy to run a data center. Uh, now, what's happening, though, is that the, uh, the cost or the computation associated is usually, how can I say, is proportional to the usage, okay? So you run your applications and, and they just, uh, and, and like we're basically doing right now while we're recording this podcast using a web platform. Uh, now, the difference with, with when it comes to AI, though, is that the AI usually has two sides, okay? There is the usage side, which is called, somebody might hear, might hear the term, uh, inference, uh, which is actually the moment where you ask a neural network or like a Gen AI, please answer this thing. But it's usually, it can be expensive uh, computationally, but it's still within the kind of same approach of you're using any cloud computing resources. Uh, the, the place where actually most of the heavy computation happens is when you train a model though. Uh, and, uh, and especially what we are realizing right now is that the current gen generation of generative AI approach is what somebody might call brute force. So what the, these, the large companies nowadays do, and I'm talking large companies, large AI companies like OpenAI and of course Google, uh, what they do is that they are basically taking all the data of the internet. Uh, well, actually nowadays, as you can see, they're actually going, trying to go beyond that and trying to access private data. Uh, and well, honestly, 
chuck it into their big models and, and crunch as much data as possible. So as you can guess, this is incredibly computationally heavy because you literally need to run to a huge amount of data and create these very complex statistical models. Uh, and that's where uh, the, the most of the computation goes. Uh, and, and that's where actually you can see the limits are, are going up and up and up. Um, the... Um, the, what's interesting and what's forecasted actually uh, is that by, it, okay, dates to be defined, but roughly around 2030, uh, to train uh, a generative AI model is going to cost, uh, if the projection keeps going, 250 billions just of buying hardware. Uh, and on top of that, uh, you are going to have a good percentage of that. Uh, which might be even double-digit percentage, is going to be energy consumption. Uh, and in that sense, you can start seeing large brands like Amazon, like Microsoft, uh, going after big energy purchase contracts nowadays uh, for the next 15, 10, 15, 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Okay, so it's because they see this trend coming uh, and, and so there's going to be a lot of problems, shortages of, of available hardware, shortages possibly of energy and, and they're really trying to find out how they can find these energy sources. I'm going to drop the second hype term in this conversation, Chris, which is NVIDIA. Uh, it's the, the, the most valuable c uh, company in the world right now. You talked about the need for uh, new infrastructure, the billions that are going to be spent um, in building that. And we are seeing these already reflected somehow in, 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 in the stock market. But NVIDIA is famous for um, its the GPUs. And I know uh, that uh, the, to train uh, GPT-4 OpenAI put together like 30,000 uh, GPUs or something like that is, is the, the, the number that I, I, I've read um, here and there. But can you, help, can you help me understand the difference between GPUs and CPUs and obviously applying the lens of the efficiency of both and what, what that means in terms of uh, potentially energy consumption? Uh, yes, of course, and you actually raised a very, very good point uh, when it comes to explain how the infrastructure evolved. Uh, the the main point, and and the again historically when you started thinking about twenty years ago, uh, the main processing unit for for a laptop or for a, uh, or for a server, unless you were a keen gamer, I'm not going to get into a second, was what's called the central processing unit. So the central processing unit is the central chip. Everybody kind of knows what the CPU is from a kind of the brain of the of the, of a lap of a laptop or any computer. Uh, as you know, uh, over the years, these these CPUs evolved a bit. Uh, well, evolved a lot, but practically the structure and the architecture has always been the same. They managed to break them up and add multiple cores. Which again, trying to overcome uh, uh, Moore's law and trying to find ways to expand them. Uh, but it's not that easy to pack up so many cores uh, um, at, at the at the same time. There are there is a lot of research around that. Maybe packing things up on multi, on a sort of also on a third dimension at the moment. These are, on, are, are built on basically things which are called wafers uh, of, in silicon, which are basically two-dimensional uh, print, lithography print, prints of silicon of the, uh, of the circuits are printed on top of the silicon. And so that's where CPUs are. Um, but, and what happened interestingly, again, was like 30 years ago or something like that, is that uh, what people realize is that when it comes to, and again, that's where it, but gaming's come, when it comes to graphical processing, uh, and, and it could be any sort of 3D environment, it was actually much more efficient to run those calculations on to break it up those calculations in many smaller cores. Each core is less powerful, uh, but again, it's not the, the computational power of the single calculation that you want, is basically being able to do a lot of parallel calculations at the same time. Uh, and at the time, there was a game changer. If anybody was into gaming at the time, starting with the first GPUs that had multiple cores, it could, it could incredibly speed up the um, uh, sort of any any game that was available nowadays. And, and it was, and, and interestingly enough, that 
move, quickly move to beyond gaming. First of all, as you can get, we're talking about graphics. So of course, you can add a lot of other professional applications into sort of civil engineering and and uh, uh, and sort of any sort of graphic design and so forth. Uh, but then, uh, interestingly enough. Uh, Probably, I mean, I come from a physics background, so not surprisingly, I would argue, physics that pro physicists that were also that were interested into gaming, they start also started thinking, why if I use uh, a sort of a multi-core GPU to run some of my calculations? Because again, some calculations are, are much more beneficial if they run in parallel, which is something again to stress a CPU cannot do. Cannot do a CPU is designed to do one calculation at a time, uh, and if you have four cores, you can do four, uh, but it's it's still kind of limiting. And with GPU, you can start doing, eight, start with 8 and 16, 32, 64. Uh, so the, the number of parallel streams you can, calculation stream you can manage grew and is still growing a lot. Uh, and so at the time, what they then when these, these uh, sort of uh, geeky guys found out is that actually you can use GPUs for that. And then what, what uh, NVIDIA realized is that, well, there is an opportunity there and they created a, let's call it a, a development stack, it can be called, which is called CUDA, which was designed to help uh, any sort of, at the time, mainly scientific applications to uh, basically build easily parallel applications running on top of their GPUs. And it was, at the, probably at the time, was, uh, was a bit of a bat, uh, but it actually turned out to be, first of all, very profitable, uh, kind of early on because actually the scientific applications were ready enough to justify that investment at the time. But it was just, and probably at the time they didn't really know, uh, the base of the nowadays evolution. Because what happened is that basically it became the de facto standard to train any artificial intelligence uh, system. Uh, and then nowadays we ended up, uh, of course, on the point of view of NVIDIA, they, uh, they uh, gained a huge competitive advantage on building chips and all the, let's say, software stack on top of those chips dedicated to building uh, AI uh, system, in particular, of course, neural networks, deep, learn, uh, deep learning neural networks, uh, uh, and lately generative AI. And so basically, if you want to run a generative AI cluster, you have to buy NVIDIA machine, an, an, an NVIDIA machine, which is basically the, the, the best technology available. Uh, but again, going back to the the, going back to the beginning of the point of uh, these big companies uh, running, basically uh, sucking up the whole internet, all the data of the internet to train their machine, you can only guess how many of these GPUs you need now uh, to basically being able to train your machine learning system with all the data of the internet and beyond. Thanks for this. It's, it is super exciting and, and super interesting. and. In, in many, uh, I've, I've drawn this parallel, and I think it, 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 it does fit with, with what you just said. We are kind of living again the, the first uh, years of the internet age, the internet boom, when uh, everybody was looking at Cisco at that time, providing that that that, that infrastructure for uh, for the web. And now we're looking at somehow Nvidia because it's the the main um, company providing the infrastructure for. Uh, for the AI world. But now looking forward and without spoiling uh, what we uh, what we are about to um, to publish in terms of the our research and white paper on the on the energy consumption of, of data centers and, and AI. What can we expect, Chris? Because the, the, there are a lot of different um, forecasts around that, uh, but there is a common thread or a missing point, which is linking all the forecasts that are out there, is the uncertainty around specific the technology and how you re-architecture do and what, what's going to come next. What, 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 what can we expect, Chris? Uh, yes, I mean, I, it, it's, well, this is a very tough question and I think we can come up with some scenarios or some reasonable assumptions. Okay, so uh, the I think, as usual, the lens is return on investment. So I think the real question, which doesn't really have an answer, is when we say, and there is a forecast of, okay, if we keep going like that in 2030, the bill to build a data center that can build GPT-8 or whatever is going to be the number by then is 250 billion. Is 
the, then the, the question is, is there going to be a return on investment of those 250 billions? And I think that's the question mark. And, and everybody's pointing around that because on the one hand, you can see OpenAI and this company asking for more and more funding money. But there is an element where most likely the limit is going to be around there. Maybe it's going to be 50 billion or 10 billion or 500 billion. Who knows? But it feels that probably the point of diminishing returns and where this, as I called earlier, brute, brute force approach is going to sort of get to its limit is going to be around that. Uh, and again, but it's important from an energy perspective to understand that at that point it's going to be energy intense already. And we are talking of possibly data center consuming at least single digit percentage of the total world uh, energy consumption. So that's going to be a fairly big thing. Uh, so the, there is a directional travel there where, okay, then what do we do afterwards? And if we go down the route, there are actually really uh, companies working on what's going to be the technologies that's going to go beyond that point. Because if, when we reach that point, it means we will need to go beyond that brute force and become more efficient and find cleverer ways to, um, to actually uh, do this computation, do this training at lower cost of hardware and of energy. And to do that, yeah, there are a few directions travel. So definitely we've seen companies like Google being their tensor processing units, which are kind of designed for AI, but there are other companies like Cerebra and a few others with new startups that are actually building AI chips. Some of them are actually fairly big. We're talking about sort of, a, of an AI chip, which can be as big as a desk, which is usually, you usually tend to think as CPUs and GPUs as relatively small com uh, computing units. But really, they're really trying to change the way uh, we build silicon chips uh, to, um, to sort of make them more efficient and designed to do AI computation. And that's one kind of the first generation that might be able to hit ready soon, I would say around 20, between 2026 and 2030. Uh, then there is another generation of computing, which is more about um, uh, kind of changing the paradigm of, paradigm of computing. What we mentioned before are AI chips, very smart, super designed AI chip, but still kind of using the, the, the old approach, which has been the approach of building chips for the like, uh, I don't know, 50 years now. Uh, and, and going beyond, it can go to where there are a couple of directions when you go beyond. One direction is what is called neuromorphic computing and which is kind of building chips still on silicon, but they don't use the usual, uh, how can I say, digital computing approach, but you can actually kind of replicate a simplified version of a neuron on silicon and that changed completely the way you do computations and it becomes way several order of magnitudes sort of energy uh, sort of cheaper to run it from an energy perspective of course there's still questions mark around uh, the the cost of the order to build that uh, but there is definitely uh, energy consumptions reductions and if scales enough and again when we talk about billions in demands you can think you're gonna be able to scale that enough very soon it also might show uh, some promising and is already showing some promising element from a computational perspective um, and then, but there are, there are also even other sort of a little bit more futuristic directions. Uh, some directions which are mainly going towards the energy efficiency, uh, in particular, some direction like uh, talking up, there are there are already, there is actually recently launched a star, startup or actually startup was launched before, but they were in stealth mode and I think it's called Varia Computing, um, that they actually building a thing which is called adiabatic computing, which basically means uh, that you can, or reversible computing, which means that you don't consume energy or almost zero energy consumption uh, chips. Uh, that by, store, if you think about that, that's all about any sort of electronic and electricity is made by moving electrons around. And when electrons move, they release heat, which is photons. Uh, basically, they think they came up with a way where they don't release the heat anymore. So you can do the computation and then you can capture the heat that has been released to use it again for another computation. Uh, and that would decrease again of several order of magnitude the energy consumption of chips. And so that's another direction of travel. But if we go back to the sort of the 
bio or sort of the neuromorphic computing. There, there actually recently, a few weeks ago, I was uh, I've, I've, I've recently found out uh, a startup. I think in Switzerland, if I remember correctly, this just launched uh, a cloud brain. Uh, I'm not joking. Uh, you, they are they have been able to build an organoid, uh, which is uh, probably some people heard is basically a sort of a mimic of an actual organs uh, and they build a brain organoid uh, starting off of stem cells and they connected it to the internet and you can run computation on that brain. Uh, it's actually a collection, it's not just one, I think it's four, I don't remember, there are a small number of those. And again, honest, if we talk about artificial intelligence, as far as we know, human brains are the most energy efficient machines to run arti artificial intelligence or in any sort of intelligence computations. Uh, so in, th in theory, that should might be the direction of travel. Uh, so again, just to show that we have a theoretical limit uh, across the over sort of the for over the next uh, let's say five years, five six years, uh, but there are already ideas on how we can overcome that limit and, and go beyond from a point of view of uh, making this computation under an element of making it more efficient from cost and energy perspective. As as in always, I would probably and this is probably a, a good a good place to um to close. Uh, when you see the limit, you start already working on it. There is, you know, the, the, our whole society is based upon the idea that you don't need to reach the limit. There's, there's already an incentive to, and uh, to find out solutions uh, well ahead of that. And that probably it's the interesting bit, but it's the, the, the most complicated thing uh, right now when you want to forecast the, uh, the consumption related to AI is that something is going to happen, something is going to change uh, the current paradigm as, you know, NVIDIA did uh, 13 years ago, 15 years ago, as you said earlier, and, and it would probably come well before we, we hit the limit. Chris, thanks again. Uh, it's been super interesting and, and super insightful. Uh, and I hope you all enjoy it and to the next episode. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me.